All right, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to the University of the Free State. I'm glad to see so many, so many people here this morning. Um, uh, my task is just to give you a little bit background on the Thought Leadership Series, and then I'm going to hand over to, to Max Depria that will do uh, the rest uh, uh, and manage the rest of the activities for this morning. Now, the Thought Leadership Series, in fact, started last year. Uh, the University of the Free State decided that as a university, uh, we need to project ourselves as a thought leader, uh, an entity or an institution that uh, pro provide platforms where we can debate topical issues, but debate these issues not purely from an ideological perspective, but as a university, we often drive evidence. We wanted to know what is the information that the support any statement that you make, and that we would provide those sort of platforms for that discussion, sort of shifting discourse. Um, and we started the uh, inaugural series last year on land reform. And I must say it went fantastically well. Uh, some of the outcomes of that series, uh, or um, in fact there were two, two or three panels, that was fed into uh, the land reform debate. And uh, one of our council members, uh, Dan Creek, uh, has been serving or is serving on this uh, presidential panel. Uh, and some of that information also went into for the panel discussion. And as a university, we sometimes ask ourselves, what is our contribution to development in the country? Uh, obviously also in the continent and in the globe, but specifically now in South Africa. And we often get the response by saying, we're doing research and we publish and therefore also uh, steer thinking. We also produce graduates that will go in and uh, uh, um, add to the economy. And, uh, um, but, but I think we should also try to do more because some of those things we inherently would do. But I believe that if we look at the challenges that where we are in South Africa at the moment, our current economic growth, where we should be, the fact that there are pressure on so many things from, uh, um, from electricity to the way in which we manage cities uh, to the way in which we look at employment. Uh, by the way, graduate unemployment is about 6%, but if you look at um, unemployment generally, it's, it's, it's extremely high. And to what extent does higher education, universities, contribute to that uh, in terms of solutions? And we wanted to shift the thinking that universities can only contribute long-term solutions to say, well, we also have to rethink what solutions we provide. Solutions that could have a spread between short, medium and long-term. And that's the reason why Thought Leadership Series is for us so crucially important. And the way that we compose the panels is because we would like to project the university as a thought leader in these panels, you will also find a university representative, uh, um, and Max will introduce that individual or individuals later, but also people outside of the university, in the country, that have made their mark, that have indicated they have very, very strong views, that are also advancing the discourse, and they are people that we also have invited to participate. So from my side, uh, uh, Max, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to facilitating the panels and also to the members, um, the external members, first of all, for accepting the invitation to participate. Uh, and I'm looking forward to a very lively discussion uh, and also like to hear what thoughts our panelists will have uh, on this very, very important topic. So over to you, Max. And Max Dupria is the facilitator of our sessions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Peterson. Um, good morning. Um, yeah, we're dealing with the, almost the mother of all topics uh, today because um, I remember um, 1992 when Bill Clinton was running against, uh, running for president in the United States. His slogan was, it's the economy, stupid. And we can say that today. So every question we have, political or otherwise, it's about the economy. 
Prince and I had breakfast together this morning, and he suggested that all political analysts like me be sent to uh, re-education camps <laughs> to learn about the economy. <laughs> so, so I'm going. <clears throat> so thank you very much to our panel. I'm starting with, uh, on my right, Davi Ruet is Director and Chief Economist of the Efficient Group. Maura Davi. We are old sparring partners. Uh, Annabel Bishop, over there, is Chief Economist of Investec. Prinz Maschele is Executive Director of the Center of Politics and Research. And Professor Philippe Berger is Vice Dean Strategic Projects of the Faculty of Economic and Management Services, uh, Sciences at the Free State. Philippe, I, maybe we should start with you. What we're going to do is give every panelist uh, give every panelist about ten minutes, and then we will engage in discussion, and then we'll go to you for your questions. Philippe. Okay, here we go. Um, can I get my presentation on there at the back? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good, good, good morning. Um, I think to say that the South African economy is in serious trouble is a bit of an understatement. Uh, I'm not going to say all those details that you see there on, 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 on the slide, but we know that economic growth is very low. We know that, uh, that, that our SOEs are in trouble. But specifically, I want to highlight the fact that unemployment in this country is extremely high. There are two ways we, we measure unemployment. The one is the official definition of unemployment, which looks at everybody who's unemployed and looking for work actively. And that is at 27%. If we look at, uh, if we also include those people who are, who want to work but have given up work because they couldn't find work, we are at 38% unemployment rate. Just to give you a bit more uh, perspective, in South Africa, from the fourth quarter of 2008 up to the first quarter of this year, this economy, uh, the number of jobs in this economy grew by 1.5 million uh, people. So 1.5 million pe more people were employed over that 10, 11 year period. But the number of unemployed broadly measured increased by 4.1 million. Okay, so I think it's an understatement to say that the economy stalled and that we need to look at how to, to, to look at it. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into all of that detail, but this is just a, a graph showing you what is called the Gini coefficient. Zero being everyone equal, one being, you know, one person having everything and nobody else has anything. So the closer you get to one, it's more unequal. We are that dark blue bar on the right hand side. We have the highest level of inequality in the world. Okay, so that, all that unemployment contributes to this. But just 12 years ago, we had economic growth between 3 and 5.5%. We had an unemployment rate that fell from 26 to 21%. We had ESCOM with no government guaranteed debt. Our public debt came down from the 50% in the, in the late 90s to 26%. And guess what? In 2008, we actually had a debate about what to do with the surplus on government's budget. Yes, it's just 12 years ago. So, I don't want to go into all the gory details of state corruption and so on. When you switch on the TV, you have more of, uh, enough of that. What I want to focus on is to see those lessons that we can take from the past 20 years, what can we learn from that, and what sort of growth strategies can we implement to get this country growing again. Uh, so I look at long-term growth strategies and medium-term. But first of all, why do we need growth? Well, that graph shows you why. The dark blue, you know, shaded area there, that, that is the economic growth rate in the country since 1985 all the way till now. And the black line there, that's the growth in employment. And you can see them move together. So if the economy grows, we have growth in employment. If the economy doesn't grow, we don't have growth in employment. So then, for we need some growth. There are two ways to look at the growth. We can have what we talk about export-driven growth, we can talk about in investment-driven growth. Now, from gear onwards, we've been trying export growth, export-driven growth. But we have a few problems there. First of all, as the National Development Plan's diagnostic uh, document acknowledged, uh, our wages in South Africa are three to five times the wages in other emerging market countries. But our productivity is not. Okay? So we can't compete in terms of wages. And to say that our wages have to be a third or a fifth, 
that's just politically un unsustainable. So that, that ain't going to happen. Okay, so we need to think about something else. But there's also another problem. We are now moving into increasing scenes of world trade wars, you know. We will, and we are like the little mouse that will get trampled, or should I say trampled, by the US <laughs> and the, the China uh, trade war. But instead of looking at, at, at trade overseas, I think we need to look at trade over land. Let's focus on SUDEC. You know there are 300 million people in SUDEC. If only 10% of those people join the middle class in the next 10 years, that creates a market of 30 million people who will need fridges, stoves, and maybe buy it at Willys. So that there are huge opportunities there. Uh, now, there are movements like the African Continental Free Trade Agreement that they talk about. I see Nigeria signed yesterday, finally. Uh, but that is like a continent-wide project. It will take another 10 or 20 years. I think we need to focus more on SADC now. But it will take things like the political buy-in from all the governments involved to deal with the regulatory and legislative issues that inhibit trade between these countries. We need to expedite flow at border posts and they'll not get stuck there. We need to invest in roads and rail. You know, it's more expensive to import sugar from Zambia than it is to import it from Brazil. Okay? We need to look at that. And then the governments, none of these governments have a lot of money, so we really do need to pull in more private sectors to develop that infrastructure. So that brings me actually to the investment-driven growth. South Africa's investment, gross investment, is like 19, roughly, percent of GDP. The question, is that a lot or is that not a lot? Well, I think the one way to look at this is to say, okay, let's talk about the country's capital stock. So in investment is, net investment is just what we add every year, but add to an existing stock. If we look at the, cap, the country's uh, capital stock, that's, there's the graph from the mid-90s, you'll see it fell from 360% of GDP to 260% of GDP. Okay? It's slightly increased. That increase you see is Medupi and Kusili, and we all know how well that is working. So we really need to look at investment. But how do we do that? So it's one thing to say we need it, but how do we do that? Now, what I do like from, uh, and what you will see, and let me just move on one slide already to that way. You might have heard of Rolf Meyer and Johan, uh, Johan Fassel's uh, public-private growth initiative. I think that is the right thing to do. In the president's sonar, you know, everybody focuses on the president's high-speed trains, but he talked about master plans and things for oil. And that, there, there's a, and he talked about partnership. I, I lost count of the amount of times he talked about partnership between business and and, 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 and government. That is the way to go. And the way I think the, the true secret will lie here is that we need government to make deals with the big corporates in each sector of the economy. Okay? And these need to be concrete deals where government says, okay, what holds you back from invest investment? Is it, is it regulations? Is it laws? Is it labor? Is it what? And then they reach an agreement where the Government says, okay, in terms of legislation and policy, we will do this. But then what is your investment target that you will reach in this next five years? If you don't, then we roll back, of course, those, those agreements. So, so, so that is sort of the, the types of things that, that we need. What makes it easier, in a sense, in this economy is that we have high levels of concentration. So usually we say... The level, high levels of concentration is a bad thing. You have two or three companies dominating each sector of the economy. And that is a problem. We need to expand competition. But in terms of making deals, it makes it easier because you only have two or three people to go talk to. Okay? So, but part of those deals need to be the, how will these corporates, that's part of what they also need to deliver. How will they open up? How will they get new entrants? How will they develop and bring small business into the development of their supply chains, etc.? Then I want to quickly focus, yes, education. We really do need to focus on that. Um, the, the, the literature is quite clear. The quality of education, the higher the quality of education, the higher the growth rate you have as a country. Quickly, I want to talk about the medium-term challenges. We need to fix our state-owned enterprises. By privatizing as far as possible, and the, there where we don't uh, privatize, at least bring in private equity partners. 
We need to fix our fiscal policy. It's not sustainable. That, those are the graphs of our debt GDP ratio and uh, if we add also this, the guarantees to the ESCOMs and the SAAs. If we include that, we're moving to 70% of GDP. That's way, way too high. And even Titu Mbaweni acknowledges if we hit 70% and with all that SOE debt comes on government's budget, we will go to the IMF hat in hand. So we need to fix that. Uh, we need to, and I'm just going to scroll quickly through these. The one big problem there is government expenditure. It has gone, operating expenditure uh, of what we call general government, including provinces and local governments, has gone from 30% to 36% of GDP. That's too much. Uh, the big problem is the salary bill. It has gone up, government salary bill has gone up from 11% to 14% of GDP. Now, you can't just in one or two years take it back from 14% to 11% because that is 20% of civil servants. So what I've proposed to the National Treasury is to say, okay, the salary bill can grow in, 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 at half the rate at which the uh, nominal GDP grows. Nominal GDP is real GDP plus inflation. At half that rate, you do that for four years, then it goes from 14% to 12.5%. Okay, but that means that if you want to give inflation-linked salary increases, then you have to reduce the number of people employed by government. And we can do that, uh, but it is a longish process, and you have to manage that, and you have to talk to the unions how to do that. Uh, the other one and a half percent uh, that of government expenditure cut will have to come from goods and services. Um, but there you review all existing contracts, and you know, close them down if there was corruption, etc. To conclude. Uh, I'm, the core of my call is for governments a change in attitude towards the private sector in the sense of going for true partnerships. But we also need a change of attitude on the side of business to, to, to lift the gaze from the next quarter profits to the next quarter century's profit. Because if you can get this economy growing, you can get more competitive etc. And you can do the investments and you can get that growth, the job growth will have uh, or will be the result and your profits will also come. But you, through that partnership you can align your objectives. Thank you very much. Thank you Professor Berger. Uh, Annabel, you're next. That's on. Good, and can I get the clicker as well? Thank you so much. It's lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good, okay. Well, I think our presentations are similar in terms of diagnostic. <clears throat> Certainly, my first slide. I'm indicating to you that we have seen a strong economic growth before. We've actually been in an environment, indeed, we've been in sub-investment grade before from a credit rating perspective. And indeed, in 1994, we actually inherited a substantially poor government finance situation, not dissimilar from where we're sitting now. Indeed, it took for several years to repair and fix it. We saw the Mandela years certainly seeing a lot of focus on fiscal consolidation. <clears throat> and come the following presidency after that, certainly for 10 years thereafter, we saw a substantially stronger fiscal base from which to operate from, certainly one from which to spend in terms of government infrastructure and indeed promote a lift in government co and confidence by improved governance in the environment as well, really lif lifting up economic growth. I'll unpack it more deeply for you, but if you have a look at the graph, you can see, I'm not sure if there's a pointer, you can see that... Okay. You can see that there is a strong upward trend coming from your late 90s. And indeed, you know, it's reminiscent to me that this may well be in the period we're in now. We've seen a change politically. We've seen a change in leadership in the ANC and the country. But essentially, we're still seeing a weak, non-performing economy. And I'm sure many of us remember in the late 90s the expectation or the confusion of why economic growth was not picking up as we'd advented into democracy. Certainly having a look <coughs> where we are now in the current decade, we've seen that fiscal stimulus has actually yielded little long term now from a growth perspective. Indeed, our government finances are seriously deteriorated to the point of risking a credit rating downgrade. And indeed, our economic growth is very weak, seeing a downward trend dropping from 3% to around half a percent this decade. 
And if you have a look at the very negative growth that came out in the first quarter, sure, it's likely to be reversed in the second quarter by a similar figure of around 3%. But for the year as a whole, we'll be lucky if we get to 1%. So we've seen this evolving downward trend in economic growth. And the risk for us is, do we actually go below zero? Do we actually start to move into an environment where the economy has truly stalled? As was mentioned earlier, unemployment is close to 30%. And if we have a look at this following graph, quite an interesting one, I've overlaid government debt and corporate savings. So in South Africa, government debt to a large degree is financed by South Africans ourselves. 37% is financed by foreigners, so foreigners do hold 37% of government debt. But the remainder is held by South Africans. And indeed, with government at dis-saver, not saving but borrowing, and with household savings around 0%, clearly the savings tend to come from the corporate sector. And indeed, you can see overlaying these graphs show that is exactly where it's come from. Inverting the axis on the right-hand side shows the corporate center, sector essentially funding government borrowings. And how does this happen? Well. Lesetja Kanyaga, our Reserve Bank Governor, says essentially high levels of government debt in South Africa have actually crowded out the private sector, crowded out private sector investment. What does this really mean? It's crowded out the incentive for investment. If you're looking at government bond yields of perhaps around 9%, from a long-term perspective, 10-year benchmark government bond yields, you're offering a very high interest rate, a high incentive to save and not to invest in the economy. And indeed, corporates putting monies into the banking system, the banks turn that money over, as you know, turn it around in, in normal banking operations. But with government regulations, many of them indeed coming from banks overseas in Basel, you see that banks are required to hold a high level of um, liquid assets. And these, of course, are government bonds, particularly treasury bills. So banks being regulated to hold a high level of government debt. And of course, you can see the symbiotic relationship in South Africa. So what happens if government says to the private sector, you need to now stop um, investing in the banking system and holding your money in deposits. You need to now turn this into investment in South Africa. They'll go to the banks and say, we need to withdraw our money from our savings account, typically money market. Um, accounts and wholesale funding. We need to withdraw this money. We need to now invest it in the economy. And the banks will go to government and say, I'm afraid we need to cash in our government bonds, our treasury bills, because we need money to pay out the private sector corporates who are coming to us for money. So you can see this symbiotic relationship that has happened in South Africa. And as Lesetja Kanyago says, our Reserve Bank Governor, it's sometimes seen as an investment strike by business, but is, is better understood as crowding out. I'll show you here a graph in terms of our credit ratings in South Africa. You can see on the left-hand side, markets indeed deem that we are already seen as sub-investment grade. South Africa, the red dot there, Brazil on the right. Perhaps you might ask, why are the other countries who are sub-investment grade not on that graph? Well, obviously not qualifying in terms of these credit default swaps. So if we are already seen as <clears throat> being sub-investment grade by markets, what does this mean for us in terms of a credit rating downgrade? Well, here I'll show you a quick graph just before we get to that, looking at our government debt. You can see again, I've inverted the axis on the right-hand side. When we have a high level of government debt, you can see what we experienced when Nelson Mandela became president in the early 90s. We had better um, explain there's a sub-investment grade environment. You can see as we work down our government debt, so our credit ratings improved to an A-grade level. <clears throat> Moody's has obviously said to us, because our debt levels have risen so substantially, we are now back in the sub-investment grade territory, and indeed including Eskom's debt into this quantum certainly places at us at risk of seeing a credit rating downgrade. Eskom, of course, as well, if you have a look over here, anticipating further borrowings previously, very difficult now because without the government-backed guarantees, government guaranteeing its debt, it'll have to go into the markets on a standalone basis, and as a consequence of that, very high interest rates. So, you know, quite a difficult environment we find ourselves in. What would a credit rating downgrade meet, mean for South Africa? As you saw earlier, markets have already significantly priced in a credit rating downgrade for South Africa. Having a look at these graphs, I've done a study saying which countries in the world have seen a significant credit rating downgrade, where your country's credit rating from all three key agencies, Fitch, Standard & Poor's and Moody's, obviously the other ones don't really matter because they're not really impacting the markets in terms of their decisions. From those three ratings, if countries have seen a downgrade from all of them, what has been the impact on the markets and the economy? And you can see from our tables over there that markets tend to anticipate this downgrade. And that's what's happened in South Africa. You recall a few years ago, our government bond yields were lower, certainly a decade ago. So anticipating the downgrade, but at the point of downgrade, you can see your yields rise by about 1%. Quite important for us because the Reserve Bank has estimated this means you could see interest rates 
the repo rate, the prime lending rate, your mortgage bond rate, rising by about 1% as well. So you would expect to see the whole cur curve lift. And indeed, of course, you would also anticipate seeing some currency weakness. Perhaps what is misleading about this examination is certainly that it depends what type of environment global financial markets are in. You remember last year there was a massive global equity sell-off, huge risk aversion levels, indeed a correction in the equity markets towards the end of the year, as there was disbelief and then suddenly markets had to then factor it in. The fact that the US really was going to hike interest rates substantially at a time as well where we saw very substantial global trade tensions escalate and fears of a massive slowdown in global growth. Higher interest rates, slowdown in global growth, massive substantial risk off. This year expectations the United States would cut interest rates and the worry that growth will slow has seen less risk off. In fact, fairly neutral environment. If we lost our credit rating, our last significant credit rating last year, we would have likely seen a much bigger market reaction than if we were to lose it this year in a calmer or more neutral global market environment. So that's the one factor which is quite important. The other factor for us as well in South Africa is that a lot of funds are heavily invested in us on investment grade status. If we lose the investment grade status because of their documentation, they'll need to sell us off. So you would expect to see that currency weakness. Looking into the following few years, you do tend to see some return in strength because your prices are cheap for your bonds and people come back into the markets, but essentially that is where we'd sit. Substantially higher borrowing costs than you can see for really four years prior to that. <clears throat> so moving away, I think, from the markets and having a quick look at what's been happening in South Africa, if we actually have a look at the <clears throat> unemployment rate, again I've inverted the axis on the right hand side, you can see South Africa has very worryingly and continues to have a massive deindustrialization trend. So manufacturing is a percentage of GDP to understand it simplistically, but certainly the mining sector as well. These have been at the expense of decent jobs in South Africa, so loss of jobs in those areas. Your manu manufacturing sector has shrunk, your unemployment rate you can see has risen alongside it. Industrialization has fallen materially over the last few years as well, and indeed in South Africa, if you talk to the manufacturing industry, they found the regulatory burden particularly onerous. And that's a point that we would really highlight in today's discussion in easing the, 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 the improving the ease of doing business, in easing the regulatory environment to not just cut red tape to make it a lot easier to do business in South Africa. I don't know how many of you know, but the foundry industry, heavy, the most heavy industrial activity of all in the manufacturing sector, is essentially collapsing in South Africa. Onerous heavy regulations, onerous regulatory blockages, where it can take over a year to get an environmental impact assessment done and allow you to to put your smelter online, it's very expensive for businesses. You're borrowing money from the bank, huge amount of money for these smelters, you can't put them online. But more difficult than that, you get confusion coming through from government departments themselves. Evidence from these manufacturers indicate that you may well have been deemed compliant for your production over the past 10 years or so. Suddenly, new inspectors will come in and say, you are not compliant, that was an error, but you are liable pay a fine for these past 10 years and indeed your owners and directors will go to jail. And this is a huge disincentive for manufacturers in South Africa, it's dropped confidence enormously. And as a consequence they would shut down manufacturing lines until they become compliant, which is very difficult to do in the past 10 years, become a lot less easy to do business. And retrench workers and indeed even shut down factories. So this is a little vinaigrette, a little anecdotal evidence of some of the key areas in the economy which from a macroeconomic level really practically need to start changing if the president really is serious about improving the ease of doing business in South Africa, about reimagining industrialization, he says, about reindustrializing South Africa and really lifting economic growth and allowing for easier operating environment, greater employment and greater growth. I believe I've probably run out of my 10 minutes so I won't carry on. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. Prince? Good morning. I assume I'm talking to human beings. Let me start by greeting. Good morning, it's real. I'm greeting. <laughs> I realize that uh, it's not a formality. You know? <laughs> we must always remember we are human beings. So we must, did you have a good night? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, Max, you didn't realize the trick I was playing on you. you know. I'm a political analyst, so I need to go study the economy. So I wanted someone to accompany me, and you have agreed. <laughs> <laughs> 
fortunate to have Professor Bega here is going to teach us. Uh, <coughs> I've been given a, a very difficult um, topic, employing the unemployed, uh, as if I know how to do so. Uh, if I knew how to do so, I'm sure there would be long queues at, at the gate of my house, people coming to be employed. <coughs> now, I have broken the topic into three questions. Number one, who are these people who are unemployed? Because if you want to employ them, you must know who they are. If you don't know who they are, you're not going to employ them. The second question is, uh, why are they unemployed? Because if you don't know the reasons why they are unemployed, you wouldn't know what to do to employ them. And the third question is, what must be done to employ them? So those are the three questions I'm going <clears> to <throat> try and answer in, in less than 10 minutes. Let me begin with the, the first one. And the university, as far as I know, is a place of truth. So I'm going to speak the truth, even if it's uncomfortable. Is this a place of truth? OK, I wanted to check that. <clears throat> Let's be brutally honest about it. If you were to take South Africa and take all the black people out and you remain with whites, imagine the picture that would remain. Let's just imagine. What do you think the percentage of unemployment would be? There are no black people who remain with only whites. Probably South Africa would be in the top 10 of the world. Probably unemployment would be less than 5%. Because as far as statistics South Africa tell us, it tells us that uh, poverty as a percentage of white society is 0.6%. That was the last study done. Right. So you would have almost full employment. So who are these people who are unemployed? They're not white. We've established in less than a minute. They're black. So we know who is unemployed. It's black people. It's not white people. <clears throat> Let's go to the next question. Why are they unemployed? That's the second question. To answer that question, we must ask another question. Why are whites employed? Why, are, why do whites not have a problem of unemployment? In our own country, we live with them, right? Why is it that they don't have a crisis of unemployment? So we must not get out of South Africa to find answers. We must look here. One, it is because in the main, whites have skills. They, they have skills. So I have said to fellows who want to expropriate land without compensation and all sorts of madness, I said to them, you look in South Africa and show me white people who lost farms in Zimbabwe who are begging at street corners because they lost their farms. If you show me those whites, I'm going to show you hordes of black Zimbabweans who are in South Africa standing at street corners every day looking for employment. Right? I can tell you, I can show you my part of the analysis. You are not going to show me whites. You know why? It's because whites, those whites had skills. So you can take a farm, they go wherever they go. Some of them are in Zambia, Nigeria, or Mozambique, wherever they are. Some of them are here. You will never find them begging. Why? Because they have skills. So if you want to solve the crisis of unemployment among those people who are unemployed and who have established who they are, they are black, you need to give them skills. It's not complicated. The answers are, are, are here. So I've answered the question, uh, what needs to be done? Maybe I can conclude. No, but before I conclude, let me, <coughs> I still have uh, five minutes or so. So let us, let us assume that you have now given black people skills, right? We have identified them, they are unemployed. You have given them skills. There are certain things that you still need to do more. 
And by the way, once they have skills, they themselves will be part of the solution. One, they need to set up factories and produce things. It's not complicated. Whites have been doing it in South Africa. They have been setting up factories to produce things. The reason why, for example, if you go back to history and uh, Max is a historian, in this, during the Second World War, when global trade was disrupted, so ships couldn't sail freely across the oceans, right, to transport stuff. South Africa was self-sufficient. The Boers, the Afrikaners, were producing things themselves. Anything that they needed, they could produce. Even, by the way, producing for the British at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a fellow called uh, Hendrik van der Beel, right? There's a place called van der Beel Park. That chap could set up a real factory, ISCO. He set it up. An engineer, practically set it, setting it up, producing steel, producing whatever he wanted to produce. The crisis is this. Over the past 25 years, the black government, and I hear the statistics, right? About surplus and so on, and then we ask the question, what do we do with the surplus in 2008? The black government has not produced an industrial class, especially a black industrial class, over the past 25 years. So the thing that we call economics in South Africa, outside this surplus and this and the other, it's not, re it's not the real economy. What is the real economy? The real economy, I saw it, I was in South Korea uh, in April. So in the morning in, in South Korea, there's chaps who wake up, go to a factory to produce a thing. It's called Samsung. Here it is, you have, have it in your pocket. Yes, there are thousands and thousands who wake up in the morning, go to a factory to produce stuff. And if you look, by the way, in those countries, because that's where global growth is. It's in Southeast Asia. So Southeast Asia is the leader of, uh, of, uh, of the world. Those chaps, when you study them, they produce things. They are, by the way, they don't wait for outsiders to come and produce for them. They do themselves. When you are in those countries like South Korea, Singapore, even China, by the way, you can see products, whether you look at cars. These are, they produce their own cars. When you are in South Korea, by the way, you see very few cars that we see on our roads. So they are Kia. They are Hyundai, right? By the way, they have more. What we, the Kia that we have here, it's, it's actually the last grade. They have the top gear that can actually beat a Mercedes S class. You like, when you jump into it, like, wow, what kind of luxury is this? We've never seen it. They have a, a Hyundai, a Genesis, that can beat any brand in, on, on Mercedes Benz. We've never seen it. So they produce their own stuff from big to small things. Are we producing? No. The economists, the statisticians are telling us manufacturing is going down, mining is going down. If you remove mining and, and, and manufacturing, by the way, there's nothing that remains in South Africa. Look at our economy, right? When you drive around, here in Bloemfontein, whether you're in Pulukwana, whether you're in Nelspray, it doesn't matter where you are. There are certain things that you see clearly that define the character of our economy for the past 25 years. One, residential estates closed gate residential estates. You see it. You don't need to ask. Two, in places, offices. So you could say that's real estate, that's construction, right? Three, and most importantly, shopping malls. So if you take these three, you can see this is the face of the change that has taken place over the past 25 years. What does it tell you? If I go to a mall today in South Africa, the thing I'm going to buy from that mall, it may be owned by Old Mutual, it may be owned by Sanlam, it may be owned by locals, that mall. But the stuff that I'm going to buy there, it's not made in South Africa. That is the crisis of the South African economy. So you are not going to employ these black people who are unemployed if they don't have skills, number one. Number two, if they themselves, among themselves, they don't have an industrial class. So what is called a, an investment strike, and Max stop me, I talk a lot. Uh, what is called an, an investment strike, if you look at it from a political economy point of view, this is what it means. If I were white, I made good money when things were still good, right? 
And I sense that this, the country is drifting in the wrong direction in the hands of these blacks, right? Let's be honest about it. Look at the Zondo Commission. Yes, yes, it is. It is a brutal truth. You said it's a place of uh, truth, right? <laughs> what do I do? I conserve my wealth. I conserve my wealth. I hand it over to Alan Gray. I hand it over to whichever um, wealth management. I say, be very careful in the way you deploy my money. Yeah, yeah, that's the instruction I give. So, you will say that is our, the balance sheet of our companies are cash awash. Yes, it's true. But I've given an instruction, be very careful the way you spend my money. So, the other chaps are not manufacturing the blacks. The other chaps, their balance sheet are cash awash. Be very careful the way you spend my money. The last point. Remember I said set up factories, the last point. Run a proper modern state. The chaps who have been running our state over the past, I would say over the past 10 years specifically, this is a bunch of fellows who, who should never have been anywhere close to a government office. I mean, let's be honest about it. <laughs> they should never have been anywhere close to a government office. You give a government office to a barbarian. The results are what we have now. What does a barbarian do? Collapse the state. They think of their pocket. Right? They don't think of a thing. They have never had a concept called a legacy. Right? This idea, which is uniquely human, that you live in order to, you live your life in order to leave something for the future generation. That generation will see this thing. You are not going to see it. It has never been in the head of the barbarians who have been running our state over the past 10 years. So they think if they build themselves palaces in Kandla, right? In 100 years, if you, if you were to live for 50 years, even 30 years, by the way, you were going to go to Kandla, that thing would be a ruin. It would be an embarrassing ruin. In fact, you would even wonder, what was this madman building this for? So, in conclusion, give black people... They are the unemployed. Remember I said three questions. Black people are unemployed. Two, why are they unemployed? They don't have skills. Three, what do you need to do? Set up factors, give them skills. Four, build and run a proper modern state. Thank you. Thank you, Prince. Um, and now for our local speaker on radical economic transformation. <laughs> <laughs> My old friend, Davi Ruth. Thank you, Max. Bye, thank you, Max. It's always nice to be with you on the platform. I can remember one it, one it, once or twice we had a bit of a sparring on, on radio. And one thing about Max, I can tell you, whatever there is, he's against it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, my colleagues over here, they've, I think they've covered most of it, so it's, it's, it's up to me now, I think, to stir it a little bit or to try to see if I can give a slightly different angle to the things that's been covered already. So let me start off with a bit of stirring. I believe the ANC and the ANC coalition that we have today is probably the most destructive force this country has ever seen. The damage done to the South African economy is basically immeasurable. Now, I can go through all sorts of things. Now, let me give you, let me, let me share with you a party trick. You don't need to know economics uh, to follow the following party trick. Uh, what we do quite a lot is that, and we've been sp talking about the fiscal accounts. Now, here's the party trick. We are currently close to running a fiscal deficit equal to approximately 5% to GDP. That means the state spends so much money, I'm only talking about the national governments. I'm not even talking about the parasitals. Only the national government. So they're spending so much money, they're getting so much money in by way of various taxes. The difference between the two is how much they're going to borrow. That amount of money that they borrow is equal to 5% of GDP. That's the fiscal deficit. Currently running at 5% of GDP. Okay. Currently, this is, the, this is a party trick. Remember this trick. So 5% fiscal deficit to GDP. The economy is growing at 1% at the moment. That means that the debt-to-GDP ratio will go up by 4% to GDP. 
roughly. This is a rough calculation. Currently, the debt to GDP ratio is about 57% to GDP. That means by the end of this year, we will have a debt to GDP ratio of in excess of 60% to GDP. Next year is not going to look different. So in order to fix this, we have to get the economy to grow at 5% to GDP to maintain the debt to GDP ratio, or, uh, or at least, uh, to, uh, say, 4% to GDP, or 4% economic growth will maintain the debt to GDP ratio. Or we have to increase taxes. Now, I can promise you we can't increase taxes more. We, 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 it's already hugely damaging to the South African economy. Or, and this is what we should be doing, we have to cut state spending. And I promise you, if we cut state spending, we're going to force this economy into another recession. And that's the price that we probably need to pay. How much do we have to cut, to cut state spending relative to GDP? The state, I'm only talking about national government, is approximately 30% of GDP. If we have to cut state spending, 4% to GDP, that means that the state spending in real terms needs to be cut by about 10% or 15% in nominal terms. Now imagine cutting the state spending in excess of 10% to GDP from one year to the next, just in order to maintain the debt levels. Politically, it is impossible. That means we are probably over the so-called fiscal uh, cliff. That's where we are. This is your potter trick, remember that one. The second point I want to mention, that's about what kind of economic growth we need. Currently, the economy is growing at 1%. Not really, but let's say at 1%. The population is growing at 1.5%. So if we want to maintain uh, per capita GDP, we need to grow this economy at least at 1.5%. We're, not, we're not probably not going to see half a percent this year, but let's say. So we need to grow the economy at 1.5% just to maintain per capita GDP. The guys that are employed are currently growing because of technological advances and so on. They're currently growing their own productivity roughly by about 1%. So you've got 1.5% economic growth plus uh, population growth plus 1% productivity growth. That means if we want to maintain, not increase employment levels, maintain the employment levels, we need to grow this economy at least by 2.5%. And we have an additional 10 million people without a job. So if we want to employ another 500,000 of those unemployed people uh, every year, we need to grow the economy at least at 4%, preferably at 5%. We're not going to see that for many, many years to come. That's point number two. Point number three, politics. Now, of course, uh, Prince has been talking about politics, and I don't want to add much to that, but it's something that I've noticed, and I think it's important for us to understand this. There are two obvious conflicts, well, a lot, but two obvious conflicts that is waiting to happen in, if you're looking, uh, looking at the ruling coalition. The first one is an, what can we call it, an internal ideological kind of conflict within the ANC, the leadership of the ANC, because I don't know who's in charge of the ANC, by the way. So who is it? Is it, uh, uh, is it Cyril Ramaphosa? Uh, is it uh, Aiz Makashula, that, that expert on monetary policy? Or is it, uh, or is it, or is it Tito Mbuweni, or somebody else? Because they say different things. Tito Mbuweni, for example, said we've got many civil servants, and I like Tito, by the way. He said we've got too many civil servants, why don't you close down South African Airways, for example? And the president wraps him over the knuckles. Uh, and then Aiz Makashula says, but we want to nationalize the Reserve Bank. The president said, no, we're not going to nationalize the Reserve Bank, not yet. And then the president said we have to fix uh, the state on enterprises. He appoints a new guy uh, to run the state on enterprises at ESCOM, for example. And when they start doing the right things, say, listen, we can't give you further increases. He sends his, his, his minister of state on enterprises, Praveen Gordon, to prevent them from doing that. Who's in charge? What's going on? What, what, what sort of lead, political leadership is it? That's the one. There must be some sort of conclusion to this. I don't know who is in charge of whatever, government. The second clash that is certainly going to happen, and that is, this is inevitable, whoever is in charge of the ANC, there will be a clash between the ANC and organized labor, especially Kusatu. Because if we want to fix the problems that we have on the labor side, Kusatu is going to burn this place down. But we are at the point now where we don't have a choice that we have to make certain adjustments and it is going to hurt people. And if we start hurting members of Kusatu, they're going, we know what they're going to do. So that clash is inevitable, inevitable and that clash it's on its way. Then I would like to turn things a little bit around, and, and I've been listening to my colleagues, and I don't disagree that much with them, one or two maybe more differences on emphasis. Now let me perhaps, if we look at this problems in South Africa, let's turn the problems around a little bit. And maybe they, we should look at things slightly differently, and maybe in a fresh way. Here are some suggestions. Now, we've got three major problems in South Africa. We've got an unemployment problem, we've got a poverty problem, and have, we have an inequality problem. I don't think those are our problems. First of all, I do not believe we have an unemployment problem in South Africa. The problem actually is employment. 
Look at it differently. Don't look at the unemployment as a problem. Look at not enough people being employed as the problem. And what can we do to allow more people to be employed? That slight difference, I guess, will get us to follow different policies. Secondly, do we have a poverty problem? And again, I don't think that is the problem. The problem that we have in South Africa is we do not have enough rich people. What can we do to get more rich and wealthy people in South Africa? And the last one is about inequality. I really don't care about inequality. The only thing I care is for the, the poor in South Africa to be better off. And if that means that we have a lot of extremely rich people, but fewer very poor people, I'm happy with that, as long as the poor are better off. Now, then my last comment that I would like to make is about my suggestion and how to fix the problems that they have in South Africa. And I know I've got very, very clever colleagues here, and they can do all sort of calculations and things, and of course they are right. But I think we have to go back to basics. What is this thing that we call the economy? Why do we have something called the economy? Why is an economy different from a non-economy? And if you really want to understand economics, I think you have to go to understand, go and ask a, a, an economics historian. They really understand economics much better than most of us, I guess. Now, if you go back in the history of mankind, when we did, did we start creating this thing that we call the economy? And I would, I think, we started creating this thing, and economies became the reality when we started to trade. And that is the trick to economic growth, trade for two individuals to exchange things between one another. Because that is the only free lunch. Because think about a simple thing called trade. If I sell something from one individual to another individual, that individual takes it and pays me or barters with me with something else, both individuals gain from this transaction. They both gain because if, they wouldn't, if there was no gain for both of them, they would not have done the transaction. So the closest to a free lunch is trade. And that's the key to economic growth. We have to make it easier for people to trade at all sort of levels. Incidentally, you will see as money evolved over time, Initially, we had barter, barter trade, and then we moved into all sort of different kinds of forms of money. And money evolved over time, and as money, money evolved over time, it became more sophisticated. But money allowed us to trade easier, and the introduction of more and newer forms of money reduced the, the friction, the cost of trade, allowing people to trade more. And the more we trade, the more free lunches we had and the more wealth we created. And that must be our starting point. Whatever we do in South Africa, we must always ask the question, is this going to make trade between individuals easier or more difficult? And I can tell you, in most instances, when we promulgate a new law, or when politicians say something, they make trade more difficult. And I can give you a long list of things. Remember the requirements for trade are, you must have ownership. You cannot trade if it doesn't belong to you. And secondly, you must be in contact with whoever you want to do a trade with. But if there's a law preventing you from selling your stuff to somebody else, then you will not trade, you will not unlock the free lunch, and you will not create wealth. Minimum wages is an excellent example. Excessive taxes is an excellent example. Infrastructure that's simply not there for two individuals to, give, to get to one another to be able to trade is another example. Uh, taxes, and you list it, the list goes on. Even education is actually something that stands in the way of trade because people that simply do not know how to access modern technology, for example, because we don't have the necessary skills. And try, and that's my advice. Of course, we have to do all these fancy and complicated stuff, but the easiest way to get any economy to grow is to make sure that people know that the stuff that I own is my stuff, and to know that I can trade and I can trade fee freely with my stuff, whether it's my labor or my, my, st my stuff that I've produced somewhere with somebody else. And the state is there not to be my partner, but to create an environment where you and I can trade easier so we can create and unlock those free lunches. Thanks. Thank you, Darby. Um, yeah, we've been talking a lot about a lot of things. I, I want to 
put it back to all you on the panel, that we're dealing with a certain political reality in South Africa. So we are talking about ESCOM, that sits like a, a lead brick in the belly of our economy, and people are saying, well, clearly, we have to get rid of some of the people. It, 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 the, too many people are employed. The same with the civil service. And yet, unemployment is our major enemy in terms of political stability. So, how do we reconcile all these economic imperatives with the political reality? A political reality where we have, as you have said, where we have a president opposed by the EFF and by the Esmacher Schule factions, sort of more populist ideas uh, of no privatization. How do we reconcile um, these two big sides and keep uh, our political stability? Can I start with you, Prince? Oh, uh, you see, by the way, and yet, this words get, gets a little more complicated. Are state-owned enterprises in South Africa a problem? Um, I don't believe they are. So a blanket answer that says they are a problem, I wouldn't buy it. In fact, there could be vehicles Ex for development. Exactly. And the crisis of state-owned enterprises in, in South they Africa don't. is a crisis of ignorance on the part of the ANC government. In the first place, by the way, when you listen to public discourse in South Africa, you would think that the ANC government created state-owned enterprises. Nonsense. They've never created state-owned enterprises. They inherited state-owned enterprises. Let's take the key ones, right? ESCOM was created by Jan Smarts and Van der Bale in the early 20s, 1923. That was the beginning of the whole thing, right? Um, the PIC was created in the 40s by the same man, Van der Bale, before he died, right? Um, uh, Sasol, apartheid, well, it was given, given away. If you look at the key state-owned enterprises, they were actually not created by the ANC government. What we are witnessing in South Africa, we are witnessing the death of the Africana model. But the Africana model had wisdom behind it, by the way. Because what that did, it said, you have <laughs> state-owned enterprises that will do two things. Number one, it will facilitate, it will facilitate, it will create space for private entrepreneurs to do business. So that's number one. Because state, the state also buys things, right? Number two, it will create employment. It did create employment for Africaners, right? The problem with the, look at the ANC, what they did with state-owned enterprise. If you look at the big transactions that the ANC government has done through state-owned enterprises, it actually did those transactions with outsiders, which is stupidity. Why? Because on the other side, the industrial class, number one, they had a problem with the fact that in a real economy, that is a private sector, you had whites who had the capacity to produce and manufacture things. So they didn't want to do business with whites, which was stupid, by the way. Number then, they were not producing their own black industrial class. So they couldn't buy trains from blacks because no black people were, were making trains. So they had to find a fellow with a, a briefcase company called Sifambo, right? To go to Spain, right? To facilitate, to buy trains from Spain. So what do we do? What do we need to do? We need to do this. We need to uh, help, and this is where I agree with, uh, with David. We need to help our people, black and white, to produce things in the real private sector. The state must help them. The, the in state owned enterprises are not a problem because they can buy things from these people. Why is it, for example, that we need to buy trains? Uh, tell me, in a quarter of a century, we don't have a company, a South African company, that can sell trains to, to Plaza. Are we going to have such a company in 50 years? If we go at this rate, we're not going to have. But we will need trains because people need to be transported from townships to factories, wherever they are. So, um, and and the, Africa needs trains. Africa needs trains. I mean, he's talking about uh, tr um, trade in, in Sadek. 
We are going to buy this stuff from the Chinese. Why? Why can't we produce the stuff uh, here in, in South Africa? So we need to produce the things in order for us to trade because we need to have these things in order for us to trade. If we don't have these things, we are going to have balance sheets that are cash awash. But we're not trading. But there is money that's sitting somewhere because we don't have things to sell. Okay, Anna, Annabelle, did, <laughs> Annabelle, did you have a, an idea? Of, I mean, let me repeat my question about the, the, uh, the, the proposal is that we make the civil service smaller and that we reduce the staff at ESCOM. And in, in that way, we double our biggest problem in this country, which is unemployment. Look, I think for me, I would rather focus on growth in the private sector. And to me, I find that a more compelling argument. And certainly for me as well, if we want to look at something that could be a real game changer now, because what we have had over the current 10 year period we're in is a very strong downward trend in economic growth that has led to all these problems we're discussing and to the questions you ask. <clears throat> Looking forwards now, if we can look instead for something which could really be beneficial and prove to be very um, solution driven to a lot of the issues that we've been talking about, I think if we have a look at the expropriation of our compensation issue, which, as we know, was thrown as a firecracker into the ring at the end of the ANC conference to try and discredit the conference itself in order to not allow Sora Mopoza to actually have the election to the presidency. Looking at a beneficial outcome from expropriation, expropriation without compensation, and I know the report has been handed to the president, mainly containing the need to deliver title deeds to individuals in South Africa, particularly government land, which there's a lot of in urban and um, suburban areas, but also um, in agriculture and uh, rural areas as well, but particularly looking at also individuals who may already have homes, perhaps in Soweto, who don't own the title deeds. And, you know, delivering title deeds to individuals could be a massive game changer for the South African economy. The financial services sector, the banking system, is very ready and waiting to allow individuals to, if they get the title deeds, to leverage that capital, to actually borrow against their homes and get skills. You know, many individuals now resort to informal lending with very high usurious interest rates, 30% and above, and individuals even manage to pay off these interest rates to start small businesses, to upskill their, their, their family and you know get the necessary skills, to give individuals access to better quality finance, finance at lower interest rates of 12, 10% less, to borrow and afford to be able to skill their family to start small businesses and to actually provide the capital we need to get the engine going in the private sector, I think is crucial for South Africa. So then you might say, well, that's not going to work because of the fact that we will have such a big backlog of the municipalities and the other areas that we won't be able to transfer title deeds. But South Africa needs to, you know, really get to the point where we start making use of what is happening globally, fall in line globally. And globally, we've seen blockchain being used, and that could be a very successful delivery mechanism to provide title deeds to private sector households and individuals in South Africa, allowing them then to leverage up the capital and provide a secure lending mechanism for the South African financial services sector as well. I think what we have talked about a lot today in South Africa is black and white people walking together on the path to repairing the economy, but we also need to look at the different sectors of the economy walking together to repair the economy as well. And <clears throat> there's little value in destroying the services sector, the financial sector, the business sector, if you think that is suddenly going to miraculously create jobs. We've already seen destruction in the manufacturing and mining sectors we talked about, but allowing them to work together instead and to leverage and become partners, it's something the Banking Association of South Africa is also looking at quite deeply as well, the blockchain environment. So I think for me, I would rather look at a private sector growth-led environment. I do take your point that the civil service is incredibly bloated and that the cost is incredibly high, but on the other hand, we do not want to bring hardship to people who are employed as policemen, nurses, teachers by cutting their jobs off and their salaries. Sure, if there's fat in the system and your top level government employees are earning excessively and having excessive benefits, that's where these cuts should come. But we cannot ignore the fact that absent stimulating and getting the private sector economy going, many other areas as well and mechanisms that I haven't even talked about or touched on today, I think is really crucial for the success because only having a strong economic growth rate, which can only be achieved by the private sector, government has borrowed itself into a hole and can no longer provide any fiscal stimulation.
stimulation. Only through a strong private sector economic growth rate can we actually lift the economy to the level where we can start to repair the damage, yes, to our government finances and the problems we have with the SOEs and you know, government debt, but to actually create the employment environment we need for the vast majority of our people, who will continue to increase. And, and what we have seen now is a, a slow, downward trend economy. It's an interesting um, debate in Scandinavia, Europe, and, and North America about a four-day work week, which I think we should discuss here. Not in terms of, in terms of them, it's, it's, it's in enhancing the quality of life and productivity, but shouldn't we start thinking about putting the civil servants on a four-day work week and reduce the salaries by 10% so you don't have to fire anybody? You don't have to lay off anyone um, and spread it around. Um, I wouldn't mind working four days a week. <laughs> Anybody with a, with a thought still on, on the redistribution of land and how that will... Uh, because the president and, and Mr. Malema and others say that a radical redistribution of land is a precondition for economic growth. Are they completely wrong, Philip? Uh, agriculture is 2.4% of this economy. Okay, so it, uh, consumption of food is cl closer to 14, 15%, so it shows you all the value added in, in, in between. So, uh, uh, and in that sense, agriculture is a key component to, 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 to keep the current account and so on, on healthy. But when we talk about land, what is way more worrisome and it is, is a new set of laws that government is, is passing that does not pertain to, the, to, 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 to commercial farming, but to land in the, the ex-homelands, the communal land. Few people realize there's about 18 million people in South Africa that still live on communal land, under chiefs. And that tenure rights, the 1996 constitution says that tenure right, that those tenure rights must be fixed. It's well, we're 22, 23 years later, we've not done that. We've had the law, like the, the Communal Land Act of, of, of 2004, the Constitutional Court threw that out because it, it tried to, to empower the chiefs. And now I see that the, the traditional courts bill is going to go through, they have new bills. And what it is about is, is two things. It's, it's number one, I mean, there's research uh, that shows that uh, the, the control that the ANC had through the chiefs ensured that people, to a large extent, voted for the ANC in, 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 in these old homelands. Uh, but there's increasingly something else, and that is the, the mining rights. Uh, you see a lot of conflicts of communities in conflict with their traditional leaders, where the traditional leader just decide that, uh, you know, particularly in the Northwest province, for instance, uh, uh, where, and look at the Tolobani, yep. Tolobani case and so on. So, so those are really the big issues which affect a third of South Africa's population. Okay, so, so that's the real land rights issues we need to fix because the, the people who live there don't have tenure rights. Now, I know they, they have overlapping use rights. So, you know, I plant my maize this year and next after my maize is off, your cows can graze there. But so, so just having old-fashioned property rights is not the solution, but we can have overlapping use rights on these lands. And if that is recognized in law, you can take that to a bank and get a loan to invest in your piece of land and improve your living conditions. Because a large part and, and, uh, of the unemployment problem in this country is, you know, half of the discouraged work seekers are people who live on traditional land. A third of the unemployed in this country live on tr traditional land. And they can't uh, uh, leverage the, what they do on that land. There's, there's a couple of shocking figures like, uh, I think it's something like 45% of all uh, livestock in this, land, uh, in this country is on traditional land, but only 5% of livestock in the market comes from traditional land. So think of the leveraging that can be done to em really economically empower people if they can get those animals into that market. Uh, that's the land debate we should be having in, 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 in this country. Can I say yeah. You see, this land thing is a populist thing, by the way. It's working. Yeah. 
by Mali and uh, his group of mad fellows. <laughs> the majority of black people actually don't need land. And most people, they, they stand, normally they convene these press conferences in Johannesburg, Mali and his group. They don't convene these press conferences in the free state where there are vast tracts of uh, maize mill land or in the Northwest or in Pumalang. That's where they should be convening these press conferences because remember, this is where there are vast tracts of maize mill land. Their members are not interested in that type of land. In fact, there are members who vote for them. The majority of people who vote for the EFF, by the way, are in Gauteng. Go look at the statistics. Where in Gauteng are they? They are in formal settlements such as Deep Sloot in Johannesburg, such as Alexandra and so on. And there they try from time to time, you see them on TV trying to invade land. What kind of land are they invading? Most of the land, by the way, they try to invade. Not these vast tracts of farmland. No. They want to build in shacks. Why do they want to build shacks in Gauteng? Gauteng doesn't have land. Uh, just look at your map, you will see that Gauteng doesn't have map, land. It is because they're not looking for land, they're looking for employment. But we don't have this debate because the EFF has scared everyone in South Africa. You don't say anything against the commander-in-chief, but the commander-in-chief has no reason, there is no history of killing anyone. He doesn't command an army. It cannot even beat up anyone. I don't understand why they fear this clown. <laughs> so here is the thing on a serious note and land debate. The majority of black people don't need land because they leave the rural areas to go to cities. They're looking for employment. Number two, just go and do your, your analysis. You will realize educated black people who need land for commercial purposes, they have it. Do you know a guy called Sir Ramaphosa? <laughs> he has vast tracts of land in Betal, in Pumalang, uh, farming uh, Inkole cattle from Uganda. So he's educated, has some interest in land. He has it, but it's mainly for vanity purposes. He's not a farmer that failed. It's only for vanity purposes to take his friends over weekend, show them, look at my cattle. <laughs> Do you know a person called Tandimudis, right? She had some interest in land. She got it. We saw what happened on the land. Do you know a guy called Gwede Mantashe? He has vast tracts of land at Kala. Do you know a guy called um, uh, Ruel Koza? He's doing real farming, by the way, in Pumalang. I've been to his farm. So if you are educated, you are black, you need land. In South Africa, you have it. No one will tell you this truth because this truth is not convenient for the EFF to get votes. They are not even aware, by the way, that, anyway, we can go into deep thing if we had a debate on, on land. There is a thing called um, uh, rents of agglomeration, right? These chaps, the economists know what I'm talking about. These chaps who own buildings in Santin, right? If you want to find them, you go find them at a beach somewhere, but they are collecting rents, right? The EFF is not even aware that there's a class like that. That's not even the land they're talking about, by the way. So this thing is way too complicated, but here's the thing, we must not fool each other. We must talk reality. Black people must set up factories, create employment for their people. That's what they want to do. Even the Africans, by the way, if you look at the, deep, the, the poor white problem, which you know better, what was the whole thing about? Was to convert an Africana into an Ebonite. Mm. At the core of it. Because that, that was the character of the English and the Jew. And over time, if you look at the success of that project, it did exactly that. So the majority of Africans, as we speak, are not farmers. Because farming is dead, you don't wear a tie like the professor. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Um, Davi, I know you jump, you, you're desperate to jump in. I also want to throw in the last thing, because we need to go to the audience now. Two popular proposals made in terms of, of getting the economy back on track. The one is, should we not be, or should we be, a developmental state? And what the hell does that mean? Um, what about a sovereign wealth fund that Floyd Chivambo proposed, and now Ibrahim Patel yesterday says, great idea, we should do it immediately. Um, Solima Paila says, 
The answer is quantitative easing. Quality easing. So let's, let's, let's print some money. Um, over to you, Davi. Okay, just a few things I'll get you, Sovereign Wealth Fund. Is it working? All right. Um, uh, okay, I want to say a lot about land, but I think we don't have time. I think the point is, is that land, has, uh, land is valueless. And if you look at the piece of land today, it produces in some instances 100 times more than 100 years ago. And where does this value add come? It happens really in labs, technology, and know-how. So you're right, let's urbanize. It's much easier anyway. Um, and your forward day week, day, uh, I would suggest many of them, we just send them home. I um, mean, I can think of many departments. <laughs> the department of, of, of uh, who is this competition commission? My goodness gracious. Department of Small, small Business Development. The, the Minister of, of Sport, just imagine what the Minister of Sport does. Imagine what the Deputy Minister of Sport does. <laughs> imagine what the Director General of Sport, I mean, imagine. Women. <laughs> Department of Women, that's another one that you need to close. Down. Um, let me tell you what, what I think. I'll get you Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, maybe I should just cover that. We have a couple of Sovereign Wealth Funds in South Africa already. The PIC basically is a sovereign wealth yeah. fund. The South African Reserve Bank's got nearly $50 billion worth of forex reserves. That is nothing but a sovereign wealth fund in a way. And that's exactly why they're after the Reserve Bank, because there's a pot of honey there. So, but certainly we need to have surpluses somewhere, and we don't have that. So, so, so it's a stupid idea. Um, this is what I think is going to happen, um, uh, and I'm very sorry to say this. I'm always very much in favor of, for example, privatization of state-owned state enterprises and that normal nonsense. It's too late. There's nothing to privatize. ESCOM is dead. South African Airways, if we want to close it down, we'll have to pay in. Nobody would want that thing. And it goes, and it goes for many of the other. It's a really too late. We are in very, very deep trouble. Now, let's make a prediction on what's gonna, how this thing is going to end. We... Um, there's a political reality, I guess, but it's an economic reality, and in the end it will be the econ economic reality, I guess, with some populism. And this is how the whole thing is going to end. You start with this nonsense, your populism, and all sort of things that we've seen the last couple of years, and then eventually you will run out of your taxpayers, you will eventually run out of savers, and then you will eventually do what is left, and that is you will print money. So we are at a stage where it's nearly impossible, let me repeat that, it is nearly impossible to turn this runaway train around. And these parties always end the same, and that is in very high levels of inflation. And that is why there's all this pressure on the South African Reserve Bank. And as long as we have people like uh, the Seche Kanyaka there, they will try to prevent this from happening for some time. But eventually, the pressure will be so great that the Reserve Bank will be broken as well. I'm afraid I see very difficult times coming for us. Thank you, Davi. We're going to take a few questions from the audience. Um, do we uh, have a, a microphone? No? Yes? That hand was first over there, and then there, and then there. And then there. And let's try and be short and sweet, we're running out of time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my question is, I think it's basically twofold. We're saying that we need to skill people to, to create employment. Um, something I want to know, we, we're going into a fourth industrial revolution, we have artificial intelligence coming in, and with that you actually can replace people and you're basically replacing two people's jobs because the artificial intelligence is at a stage where it can actually write its own programs. So you, you're replacing the person that needs to write, let's say, an algorithm or something, and you're replacing the person that actually needs to check the work. With that being said, how will that help with employment? Because in, in effect, that's actually contributing to unemployment. So how will that affect that? Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's a crucial question because that is the, that is the truth. Davi. Very quick. Please, please forget about employment. Stop crea creating employment. Stop, just stop doing that. Uh, how do you all got here by, by car, I, I take it? Why didn't you come by horse? Because if you come by horse, you're going to create a lot of jobs. 
Because if we, if we ban cars, we're going to create a lot of jobs just to keep the whole industry of the horse industry going. Please stop creating jobs. Forget about job creation. Think about economic growth and jobs will happen. Don't be scared of a fourth industrial revolution. We've been there plenty of times. There are all sort of new things that will be, that will, new kind of jobs that will be created in the process. Forget about that. It's not, if we are, make sure that when people are properly skilled, they will be employed in the new industrial revolution. But forget about job creation. Think only about one thing, and that's wealth creation and all the other things will fall in place. Philip? So the, <clears throat> what I want to add to that as well, if you have a look at South Africa, already we are importing a lot of people to do jobs in the fourth industrial revolution, and those people could actually come from South Africa instead of actually importing them. And if you look at coding, for example, we don't teach sufficient coding at schools, we don't have sufficient skills in South Africa, so we have to import a huge number of individuals from overseas to do coding. And these are the types of jobs that are created when the fourth industrial revolution. So you lose some in some areas, you gain some in other areas. If we continue to import individuals from overseas, instead of upskilling our population, we are going to lose more jobs in the face of the fourth industrial revolution. We need to actually turn our mindset around so people in South Africa can have the confidence that we actually can teach our children at school and after school all these necessary skills to actually become part of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, so I think there are two, two things that are important. The first is that you need to think about fast-growing industries that can also create spillovers to other sectors of the economy. So if you start creating wealth through sectors, fast-growing productive sectors through the uh, fourth industrial revolution type of technology, those spillovers can cr uh, create demand in other sectors that are more labor intensive. So that is usually my beef that I have with, with people who say we should just focus on labor intensive growth. That, that, that's not going to do it. If you think about it, uh, uh, agriculture is about 900,000 people, one and a half million in, in, in construction, and another two million in, in tourism. That's about four and a half million people. Just focus, those are the most labor intensive sectors of the economy. The broad unemployment number in South Africa is about 10 million. If you just look at the, the narrow definition of official unemployed, it's about 6.2, uh, which is, by the way, more unemployed people than in the US. Um, then, then we need really all hands on deck and, and, and if we can develop these fourth industrial revolution sectors, get that, that going, that, that, that would be wonderful. The other thing about technology is you get technology that substitutes humans and you get technology that augments humans. And, and I think in terms of the fourth industrial revolution type of technology, Yes, there will be jobs that, uh, that, that are replaced, but an interesting figure I read the other day, so you have automatic teller machines these days, but the interesting thing is that there are now more people employed in banking internationally than in the days where we had tellers behind the counters. But those people who were tellers now do something else <coughs> with technology, and they don't do the schlep job of you know, giving you money, that, that you do at the, the ATM. Just quickly, which is why I said give black people skills. There's a, there is not skills for employment per se. There is a favorite professor of mine at Harvard, Roberto Mangabera Ungas, now old, wrote a book on what the left should do. It's actually a Marxist. And yeah, yeah, he's a Marxist. He is critical of his own Marxism because. Marxists think of the proletariat. That's, that's the language of Karl Marx. These employed people are exploited by, by the bourgeoisie, right? And he says, no, that nonsense. If Marx were to wake up from his grave today, but he would find that, that th this thing that he thought would happen, where eventually it would overthrow the bourgeoisie, it, it will never happen. By the way, if it, should, if it should have happened, it should have happened in the US, because according to his logic, where capitalism develops the fastest and the greatest, that's where the, the revolution is going to happen. Why didn't it happen, it happen in the US? But here's the point about skills. Highly skilled people always have the capacity to reinvent themselves. This is a very important observation. So if people are skilled, you don't, th you don't think, you don't feel sorry for them that you will have to stand somewhere and plan the economy for them. No, they will find things to do for themselves. 
Here is a, an interesting example here in our hall, me. I'm a useless political scientist, right? <laughs> yes, I'm trained as a political scientist. What do political scientists do? We are trained to sit in some dingy university office and teach and do all sorts of things, right? That's what we do. And, go, and walk from the library to my office, right? <laughs> the political scientists of the future will no longer do that. You know what they will do? They will no longer sit at universities. In fact, by the way, we've got characters like Francis Fukuyama, who's probably one of the top political scientists in the world as we speak. He doesn't sit in his office, that fellow. He's rich. He's, he has been able to, he sells political knowledge and makes lots of money in the age of the fourth industrial revolution. <laughs> and I've been to his presentations. I've seen the guy operate using technology, PowerPoint, and all the stuff that is pro we call the fourth industrial revolution. So I'm saying, for as long as people are skilled, highly skilled, they will always find things to do for themselves. Thank, Thank you. you. We had a yeah. we had a hand here. Yeah. That was that was you. That was me. Thank you. I was there first. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, <coughs> remind me. I thank yes, you very sir. much. Um, first of all, I think uh, Prince, you are being very disingenuous. Um, especially when you say black people don't need land. <coughs> I think it's very reductionist to say that. Um, to link land to own economics. Um, land is dignity. Black people feel like strangers in, in their own country. Land can be linked to spirituality, it can be linked to culture and tradition. So to, on, to say that black people don't need land is very problematic. And I think um, as a suggestion, you should look into a philosopher called Uncle Ruckus uh, from the Boondocks. Uh, you'll probably find some parallels, thanks. Is anybody else want to talk about the land issue specifically? No. Okay, so why don't you take that question? I, I'm black myself. I'm sure you can see I'm dark in complexion. So I'm, I'm certainly black. <laughs> when I say black people don't need land, I mean in the sense in which the EFF is mobilizing black people. That's what I mean. Because the idea you have from the EFF is that, and then by the way, they say we must take land from whites to give to blacks, right? And the undertone, uh, it's agriculture, if you think of it, the undertone of their political message. And I'm saying we actually don't need land for that purpose. Well, you yourself confirmed this theory, by the way, because you talk of spirituality, right? That's not the EFF's vision of land. Your version of, of land, by the way, is, all, is also archaic. Because I come from the rural areas, so I, I know what I'm talking about. I grew up in the rural areas. You know what? We had spirituality connected to land. You know what my, my grandmother used to do? Used to go to the grave of my great-grandfather, right? To Paul Umkombo, there, talk to the ancestor. That is spirituality connected to land. That's nonsense. We cannot convert black people from the state of underdevelopment and backwardness if we still trap in this spirituality thing. We've got to, if you look at the world, okay, you say you are lying. Take East Asia, for example. East Asia, if you go to China, if you go to South Korea, if you go to Singapore, these people at some point, take China, for example, under Mao, all the way up to the late 70s, right? Those people were a bunch of backward people wearing pyjama-like clothes, right? <laughs> yes, they were. Then realize that all this spirituality nonsense, this cultural sentimentality thing, was actually not contributing to the enhancement of the Chinese personality. What is the modern Chinese personality? The modern Chinese personality, if you go to Shanghai today, my friend, you realize the spirituality nonsense is just nonsense. In China, the modern Chinese are the ones who are being blocked by Trump not to sell Huawei in the US, because Trump understands that the Chinese, the modern ones, not the ones who do spirituality, are taking over and they have taken over virtually the economy of the world. What did, they, what did she say when the British were debating the possibility of blocking Huawei? He said, we are going to withhold foreign direct investment. Think of it. The, China, the British had taken over China, right? The opium wars, and they even took over Hong Kong to find the fact that the Chinese for invading their, their, their territory. Today, in the age of modernity, not spirituality, 
The Chinese threatened the British to withhold foreign direct investment. Tell me if spirituality and land, the way you think of it, will place South Africa and black people in that position in the next century. This We've, we're running out of time, so a quick question over there. <clears throat> and thank you. A very quick question, uh, but just before that, on the issue of spirituality, I, I, you are highly mistaken, sir. I think you are not doing much reading on the benefits of spirituality in societies. Uh, so the, the, to say spirituality is nonsense, and it's, in fact, let me stop there. Yeah. Uh, but my question was this. Uh, to all the panelists, how do you reconcile the political realities with the economic realities? The reality is that there are political demands that are there. So, uh, and they might not necessarily be make one plus one in terms of economics, but it is, it is realities that are there. Whether be it land, whether be uh, all of those things, and then with the realities of the economy. Because you will risk, if I know one, you, as in fact uh, uh, Mr. David already responded to say no, but let it, let, let's focus more on the economy than on political realities. The problem with that is that you will eventually delegitimize governments. Because we saw this ourselves. I'll give you a small case scenario. When we slid in, 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 in universities and campuses, is that if you are not able to appreciate the political realities of your constituency, there is no logic or there is nothing else. You, you delegitimize yourself. You, you cannot lead them because you, 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 you are detached from their realities on the ground. So if you go to a Kunyen where I come from and you speak of quantitative easing, you speak of what, what is where, is lalin, that means nothing. There are few things that mean something to them, which to you might be political and not necessarily economical. So how do you then reconcile that? Or lest you end up with a state that does not have power over its people, Thank then you. what is what is there left after that? Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a quick run of, of responses, Philippe? We need to We need to decide in South Africa what we want. And in a sense, we need to decide whether we're gonna play a zero sum game going forward, where we're talking about that is what is on the table and who's going to get how many of these bottles of water. Or we need to have a conversation with our people and say, yes, there's going to be another generation or two where we need to make the necessary sacrifices to grow the cake for our kids and our grandkids. But that will mean that we can't have everything now. Now, I know this is a very, very tough thing because there are millions and millions of poor people in this country. But what I'm talking about is, 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 is from the top downwards. Uh, Prince has talked about, and, and other places also, about the consumerist uh, 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 tradition or, or culture we have in our society. What we need to look at is, is less of that culture and a culture where we say, okay, how are we going to build? And But that is not something that Ramaphosa can prescribe to us or anybody can prescribe to us. That is a consensus that we as a country need to get to, to say how are we going to grow this cake? And I'm just going <coughs> to talk about, let's talk about the, the, the whole SOE thing that, that Max also talked about earlier. Uh, there will need to be some sacrifices in a sense of, you know, if we say things like fiscal policy is not sustainable, sustainability means you can't go on. Now, if we say something can't go on, it will stop. It will collapse financially on itself or it, the IMF will just ha have to walk in one day and say, okay, you will have to do this as a condition to get a loan. I mean, I was at a workshop two weeks ago where Titumba Weni was talking, and, and he said if this, all these guarantees become government debt, and the debt goes to 70% of GDP, the IMF will be here in two years' time. Okay? That's how stark it is. And look at what happened in Greece when the IMF walked in there. Okay? State Civil servants had to take a cut of 25% in their salaries. <laughs> that is the sort of thing. So we can decide, we can either 
negotiate this among ourselves and solve it ourselves or somebody else will come and do it for us and then it's much less nice uh, because then then you're like a little kid who take orders from it from a teacher I think maybe we should take a, the, the very last question and then I'll give you all a, a last round of, of of remarks there was one last question over there which which who, who did I give the it depends on who I pointed to earlier please take it thank you Morning, gentlemen. Uh, I think what, what I want to actually just make a point and then ask a question around is the, the, the skills that Prince is talking about. Uh, if you need to give us the skills, I do not think that at the present moment, uh, the generation, which are our middle class incomers, are actually ready in terms of skills. Because now, if you are saying that uh, for the economy to grow, we need to start manufacturing, we need to start building things. Uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, the lady there said, we are actually now getting people from outside to come and assist us here because we do not have the brains. Now, universities, schools, we need to go back to the schools now and say, what are the, pro the projects that are now being put in place for 2020? We're not talking about any 2020 to say, if we're going to assist the black people to actually now come and manufacture things, how are, you, are we going to educate them to open up their businesses? Because if you look at what the government is doing now, everybody's starting a business, everybody is registering a business, and everybody wants to do business with government. And nobody's thinking of saying, let us come together as a collective, start our own thing, manufacture things so that we can sell to government instead of going to government to ask for. So now the skills thing equals to education. Education equals to investment. Investment in the, uh, then equals to job creation. And that's where we need to start. But the education is the most important thing. And I don't think South Africans at the present moment and even generations before my time are actually ready to start opening up their own manufacturers. Now the question is, how do we start and where do we start? Thank you for that contribution. Annabelle, can we start with you and then to uh, Prince the and Darby? Close, the closing last comments, remarks. The closing comments, last yes. remarks, yes, certainly. I think... Um, <coughs> Uh, just looking at some of the earlier questions that were asked as well, I think I would say that land does matter to black people. I think I would say that black people do need land as well. I think I would say that it is actually an emotional need. And unfortunately, I might disagree a bit with the Prince here and say that I think that you know there is a spiritual need as well because I think people are all different. I don't think we can discount individuals and different people's aspirations, desires, or what is fundamental tenets to their very existence. So from that perspective, I think perhaps rather instead we need to recognize that we are a very diverse population, a very multifaceted population. And as a consequence of that, perhaps rather looking at a solutions-based situation. Interestingly, uh, one of the questions was asked about politics and being representative, your political leading part, your government, being representative of the people in the country through politics. If you look at the slide in the ANC voting support over the last decade and more, you can see that the population increasingly did not believe in the ANC and something needs to be turned around. And indeed, with the uptick in the votes that we've had in the last election, you can see that there has been better belief that you know we would prefer, seemingly from the voter statistics, with better governance and less corruption in society. So I think, you know, the last um, comment and question that we had is, is, is super important to me in terms of education and skilling individuals in the economy. I don't think any way you cut it, you can ever avoid the fact that we have insufficient skills in the economy, but insufficiently skilled individuals in the economy. People who are unemployed are often deemed to be unemployable. By the way, for anyone who missed it, my name's Annabelle, in case you want to refer to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, in terms of, you know, moving forwards and looking at the idea of a collective from a manufacturing perspective, I think that is an extremely good idea. Other ideas as well are business hubs in rural areas, allowing people access to technology, access to training, access to coding, access to skills, allowing them access to the world through the internet and through emails and communication, allowing them access to the job market on a technology basis. And I think as well, um, not leaving people behind, reaching into the deep rural areas. But so too, obviously, as you said, collective manufacturing, really drawing people in and being inclusive. For me, I think that's a big solution for South Africa, inclusivity. A Anyone quick last remark. Um, do you know who are the richest people in South Africa? The Jews. Yep. Go check. 
the richest people in South Africa are the Jews. If we were to go and analyze, they actually may not own the biggest chunk of South Africa's land, but they're the richest. I want black people to play in that league. I wish I could live long enough to see black people being the richest in South Africa. If they want to continue to pray, no problem. The Africaners used to pray, they were Calvinists, very religious people, but they were poor. Yeah, for the longest time. Among whites in South Africa, they were actually the laughing stock with their religion. There was a deliberate effort made to turn Africaners into wealthy, middle class and wealthy people. You didn't tell them to stop praying or to pray more, but you needed to do something outside the space of spirituality. Now, last point about the villager. You know I'm a villager, that's why I'm passionate about these things. If you sit in a village somewhere, you are black, and you think the debates that are taking place about quantitative easing in Johannesburg have nothing to do with you, you will, famine will visit you wherever you are. You, will not, you won't even have seeds to plant when the planting season comes. Rain, the weather is going to be disrupted because the weather patterns are changing. You will not, the same piece of land that you used to get yield from, you will no longer get yield. So the debates matter. That's how the Asians woke up and they had a modernistic discourse among themselves. As we speak now, the Chinese are number two in the world globally. And if you go to China, you can see it in real terms. At some point, Japan was number two, right? And so on and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Davi? Okay, I'm, uh, you're, as you've heard, it's a, it's a bright world out there, and I'm very optimistic about things. So instead of repeating everything that has been said now, I, I would like to make a prediction on how I see the world unfolding over the next couple of perhaps generations. What is clear to me is that the world is becoming less centralized and more decentralized. Annabelle referred to things like, for example, the blockchain. That's a decentralized kind of system. That's how I see the future of the world. That means that we are probably in, um, in, a, in a process, and it's, it's happening already, where things like, for example, money is going to change completely. Uh, banking is going to change completely. Banks are likely to disappear. We're not going to know banking the way. Banking systems are going to change dramatically. Um, the, what the world economy will move to, and it's happening already, it's more to the, the tertiary part of the economy. That's the important part, the service part, the digital part. And all you really need in this new world is you need a connection and you need the necessary skills, and everybody will not be part. So expect dramatic and huge changes, which will include much weaker governments in future. And that means new technology will put a lot of power in the hands of individuals. And in future, you are going to be far more powerful, and you will have the responsibility, far more responsibility, to be able to distinguish between things like what is right and what is wrong. And I prefer in a world to live in a world like that, with a lot of dangers and the responsibility on myself, instead of the opposite. We have some politician somewhere telling me what is right and wrong. I'd rather decide that myself. Thank you, Davi. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending, and very, thank you very, very much to the panel. Goodbye. <laughs>